Hello, this is a uh, recording based on a number of different things. Uh, I go along to a philosophy club um, every couple of months and some of these subjects were discussed at the, the last one and um, I had somebody who wanted to go but couldn't make it asked if I'd record some of the um, things talked about and it also occurs to me that some of these issues might be useful for some of my students on the ethics degree that they, they might be able to use some of these philosophical concepts in essays and, and, and what have you. So this is a sort of multi-purpose um, recording. But the discussion we had um, last month, or whenever it was, I'm losing track of time at the moment, uh, was on the ideas of a Cameroonian um, philosopher called Ashili Mabembe, who, um, in his turn, bases a lot of his ideas and, and concepts on notions which Michel Foucault, a French philosopher who um, died in the in the 1980s, um, he himself had put forward a load of ideas and um, Cameroon was at one point in its history a French-speaking colony so a lot of the, the educated middle and upper classes of Cameroon are fluent in French and, and study French philosophy and French art and French music and, uh, and so forth at university. So there is a, a, a definite influence between France and Cameroon, which is probably why um, Mbembe is um, uh, quite keen on Michel Foucault's ideas. He also picks up on ideas of um, postmodernists like um, Judith Butler and a few other people. But uh, perhaps to start with, before we get more more into um, the the aspects of Mbembe's uh, philosophy and ethics that I'm going to talk about to, to set some of the, the background, it's uh, useful to mention a couple of ideas that um, Foucault came up with because Mbembe has sort of responded to them with varying ideas and, and suggesting not that Foucault was wrong, but that his ideas didn't go quite far enough. Or at least maybe that the world has changed since Foucault's day and needs to factor in a, a new sort of tier of ideas on top of what Foucault spoke about. So Foucault had ideas on every subject under the sun at some stage during his life, but particular things that are worth uh, noting in this context at least are uh, two interrelated ideas he had of, um, this is the high-tech um, <laughs> Uh, gadgetry and so on, not gadgetry, no, 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 no. high tech teaching aids, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, biopower was one of his ideas, and there's an interrelated concept um, which flows off of that of biopolitics. Um, biopower is the wish to, or well, not just the wish, the, the ability to control life, and it's something possessed by governments. Uh, a lot of, of Foucault's interest was in sort of big scale governments of, of you know, large countries, France, Germany, America, and so forth. Very big, large scale governments and how they control people. But the, the same ideas would apply if you went to some very small tribe in the Amazon or deep in the, the, I would say the African Congo or something like that, where you might have a, a, a tribal culture of 100 odd people they would still have a leadership structure, a hierarchy, and that hierarchy would deal with issues of biopower and biopolitics, albeit on a much smaller scale than, say, the government of America or the government of um, China or you know, somewhere of, of that vast, massive scale. So what is, I'm just fiddling with things here, so, um, what is uh, biopower, what is biopolitics? Biopower is, is, say, the management of life, that if you are responsible for a group of people, whether that's a tribe of a hundred people or a nation of several million people, then you are managing their lives, their bodies, in some sense. Um, from a governmental or leadership point of view, you need them to do certain things. So if it's a very small scale community, you might need them to be farming the fields, collecting firewood, uh, hunting animals, that sort of thing. If it's a very large scale, a massive modern society, you might need them um, working in factories down coal mines, you might need them to be working in the shops, in hospitals, in schools. 
in order to go and do all of these things, other issues come into play. So you need people to have a certain level of education to do whatever it is that you need them to do. You also need them to have a certain level of, of health. Um, so they've got to be well enough to go and manage certain things. Uh, and one of the situations that Fuku and various other people have touched on was that um, in the First World War, a lot of nations, European nations, realised that many of their poor people, whom they were hoping to sort of you know, pack off into the armies to go and, and fight um, these vast battles, a lot of those poor people were very unhealthy, very malnourished, very diseased, not well enough to be soldiers, be sailors and so forth. They, they weren't uh, sort of physically fit enough to go and die. If it, it was a bizarre way of putting it, but if you sit on it. So suddenly they, they developed this interest in many um, European nations that the government started taking a lot more interest in things like healthy eating, in um, health checks, in uh, you know, fresh water supplies, housing stock conditions, particularly as they affect the working classes, to get them up to a level of health where they could be used as ground soldiers in the, in the fighting battles across the European continent and so on. So suddenly it's, uh, and this kind of it, I suppose is really Foucault's point, is that when governments take an interest in the, the health and bodily management of people, it's not always because they are compassionate, kind, caring, humanitarian individuals, and politicians, kings, emperors, tribal leaders, what have you. Uh, it's because they wish to utilise people in a certain way. And so if they appear to be helping people to better health, it may be with sometimes with rather an ulterior agenda. And even when that ulterior agenda is not necessarily warfare, it's something else, it's still there. So you could argue, for example, that um, the modern British government has been running campaigns for a couple of few years now, TV adverts and posters and, and one thing or another, with little plasticine figures is, is the latest thing in adverts saying, get off the sofa, go, go and join a sports club, go and do some exercise, stop eating so much sugar, stop eating so much fat, do this, do that, do the other. Not because they're getting us ready for some grand scale warfare, I hope, <laughs> but because if we just spend all of our time sitting on sofas, stuffing our face with chips and, and sweeties, we'll end up enormous and unhealthy and, and rattled with illnesses which will cost the NHS an absolute fortune and will need time off work and that will cost the economy in that way. So they're trying to reduce the cost to the government and, and ultimately, I suppose, the taxpayer of looking after large numbers of unhealthy people. So the, the motivation isn't so much be healthy, you'll be a happy, jolly person. It's more be healthy, you won't cost us as much then. So it's more of a pragmatic kind of health concern and a way of managing bodies. Yeah, Foucault also looked at things like prison systems, um, the army, the navy, any, any kind of managed, uh, contained body of people who had to be controlled, um, had to have their, their bodies managed in various different ways. Um, which is a very weird way of phrasing it, I know, but I can't think of a better way of putting it at the moment. Um, and he, he spoke about the idea of discipline, so that, for example, a lot of prisons, at least up until relatively recently, would encourage um, their, their inmates to do sort of exercises and things like that, partly to, to kind of tire them out. Um, so with, with lowered levels of energy, they'd be less likely to fight each other, less likely to fight the guards and, and, and that sort of thing, um, and give them activities to keep their minds occupied, keep their hands occupied, again, with the, the ultimate goal of um, keeping them manageable. You could say that uh, psychiatric hospitals, for example, frequently medicate people who may not necessarily need to be sedated for, for health reasons, but are sedated because it can make them more manageable, that are less likely to have violent episodes or wander off and cause problems and so forth. So it's again about the management of people. Um, Feminist scholars picking up on this have often focused in on the way women's bodies particularly are managed uh, and that, um, for example, 
in the aftermath of, of large-scale warfare, when the population has plummeted, there's often lots of pushes and drives and, and initiatives to get, get women back in the home, you know, out of factories where they've been doing the munitions, if we're going back to the, the Second World War, for example. Being able to go back home, um, find a husband or your, your, their already existing husband who's returned from the field of battle, and get them to have children and give them tax breaks and, and benefits and child benefit, that kind of thing, to encourage repopulation and yes many people might have been really happy to be parents so there is a it's, it's not that the government is utterly disinterested in whether people are happy or not but it's more i suppose that their their happiness or their good health or their contentment is, is a side issue so long as they are doing what the government needs them to do whether that is being healthy enough to fight in battles whether that's being fit enough to go and till the fields or work in the factories or whether that is having enough children to get the population back up after there's been a massive drop, whether due to warfare or, I suppose, in some points in history, plagues, famines, things like that. It's, it's how do you get people to do what you want to make them more manageable? That's what biopower is. And biopolitics is the way in which that is implemented through policies and initiatives and this, that and the other. Um, the, the kind of day-to-day um, -day implementation of biopower. So that's that kind of background. Um, Mbembe came in and said, very interesting, what have you, you know, these are fantastic ideas. But we need to also think about um, the flip side of this, which is necropower. And of course, where there is necropower, there is necropolitics. Um, so biopower, biopolitics, the management of the living. Necropower, necropolitics, the management of the dead or at least those who may soon be dead, more to the point. So this is not so much you know, how you manage cemeteries or, or anything in that way. Rather, it's saying that um, Mbeme's idea is that governments invest in those they want to live, those they want to be healthy, those they want to be useful in some way. At the same time, there is a disinvestment in those whose lives are deemed not worth the, the financing or, or the, the you know, putting on initiatives and programs and schemes and one thing and another to keep them alive, to keep them healthy. So it can be thought of in two ways, a sort of a passive way and an active way. The passive way is deciding that that group of people over there are not worth the effort of keeping alive. So let's just ignore them, leave them to their own devices. Um, and if they come a cropper, if they become very unhealthy, or if they're engaging in activities that will drastically lower their, their lifespans and their survival rates, well, what are they? So uh, an example of that you could say is uh, homeless people in Britain. In the, the, the government, occasionally they chuck money at a charity or an initiative, but by and large, the homeless are just left to their own devices, and there are charities and churches and individual groups who run around with soup kitchens and so on but that's not at a, a kind of governmental structural level that's more at a, a sort of local initiative human compassion level so the overall aim is not to change housing policy it's not to change investment in housing stock it's not to set up drug rehab schemes to help people get off the streets it's just to sort of say well if, if to, to do paraphrase old um, Ebenezer Scrooge, if, if they die, they die, and it decreases the surplus population. What of it? Some groups of people are just left to their own devices. Um, typically, people who are very, very poor, and you can certainly make the argument that perhaps the reason they become very, very poor is because they have been left to their own devices. They've been sort of relegated into a corner and not given the extra help, the extra support, the extra aid which helps other groups of people to become financially better off and stay financially better off, um, you know, move into the middle classes or indeed the upper classes. So they've been relegated to a corner and just left to, to basically die off. Um, that's that's the sort of more passive approach. The more active approach is where governments say we, we want to get rid of that group of people over there as soon as possible. And so they start implementing things like the a very, very obvious example would be the Nazis deciding to eliminate Jewish people and gypsies and gay people and disabled people and half the known universe, um, where there are expressed campaigns to, to round them up and kill them, murder them, in some shape, guise or form. That can be governments doing it to their own people, 
as with the Nazis, trying to wipe out people initially in Germany and then in the various other countries that they, they conquered and brought under their their rulership. But it can also be through warfare of exterminating groups of people in other countries that the enemy, the foreigners in that country over there, we will attack them, maybe not every single one of them, but there may be sort of um, political factions that they want to wipe out the ones they're opposed to. And then there is another political faction in that country that the government waging the war would like to see as the, the new wave of leadership, the more you know, the ones that are more sympathetic to their own goals, so they get rid of the group they don't like, and then help the surviving group to flourish and take over that country and declare peace. You can see that plenty of times in scenarios all around the world. Um, we're, we're lucky in Britain that we don't have active campaigns to slaughter our own citizens at the moment, but sort of the, the kind of death through neglect through indifference, through underfunding. We close down another hospital, oh well, it's too far for you to go to get your critical medical care and you might die a few years earlier than you otherwise would do and the government just shrugs its soldiers at shoulders and says, so what? Because that group of people is not valued enough, and this is Mbembe's idea, it's not valued enough to want to keep them alive. And again, just as he says, all government, well, Fuku brother said, all governments engage in the management of the living. That's just the nature of, of government and leadership. You have to do that. So Mbembe is saying all governments engage in the management of death. Their citizens will die in any country, even the happiest country on earth. Your citizens will die at some point, but they're going to live forever. How do you manage that? Do you try and prolong their life and into their 80s, their 90s, their, these days their hundreds? Do you provide lots of, of support for the elderly? Or do you say, well, we'll keep them alive until they're 60 and then we'll, we'll start pulling back on the funding. So if they die when they're 70, well, and, and at some point, citizens who were being preserved have reached a stage in their life where the government no longer wants to preserve them. Um, does, it, d does a given government um, decide that some people can be worried? So we'll sort of mention the feminist angle. You can say on the flip side of that, um, most people who die in war are men. Most people who die in street violence are men. Is this because governments are effectively saying male lives are expendable? If, if loads of men die, will they die? What of it? Or at least those from certain social classes, perhaps. And, and you don't have to be a raging Marxist to see that sometimes governments that are made out of, composed of very, very rich people tend to be more sympathetic to other very, very rich people than they do to the very, very poor. So there is often a sort of um, an interesting government of looking after people like themselves and much less interest in looking after people who socially are so far removed from those in power that they, they tend to get the crumbs from the table, the leftovers, rather than that sort of an active desire to help them. And that becomes a bit of an issue in itself. Um, Returning momentarily to Foucault, one of his other ideas was the the droit de glaive, the right to kill. So, the droit de glaive is the the death blow. It's a term um, used by hunters. The the kind of delivering the like the coup de grace, the death blow, the right to kill. Um, Foucault uses it, and and, and the Bembe picks up on it that. Uh, in any given society, certain people have the right to kill. There is a dis uh, distinction between murder, which is illicit killing, killing without permission, and other forms of killing which are done with permission. And what they are will vary from one culture to the next. So, for example, where you have execution as a state practice, the, the, the hangman or the, where it is that pulls the lever on the gas chamber or the electric chair or what have you, that person has the right to kill, the legally sanctioned right to kill, so long as they do it in that, you know, they don't have the right to go home and kill their wife or kill their husband, but they've got the the right to execute someone who all the documents have been signed and approved that they can be executed. So when that hangman pulls the rope, they are not committing murder. Um, those countries that have euthanasia, the doctor giving the lethal injection to the patient who's signed all the various waivers and forms and what have you is not committing murder. They have the right to kill in that circumstance. 
uh, you could get into some really, really, really murky waters if you want to factor in things like um, abortion. Is it killing? Is it not killing? Well, that depends on your religious outlook and various other factors. But certain doctors have the right to end life. The hangman has a right to end life. A soldier going into warfare against the enemy has a right to end the life of combatants. But these days, of course, with all of the Geneva Conventions and what have you, they don't have the right to end the lives of non-combatants, of, of civilians. And so you've got the concept that certain forms of one soldier killing another soldier is acceptable. But a soldier massacring a bunch of civilians is a war crime and is unacceptable. So distinctions as to who has the right to kill where and when. So no one as such has the right to kill anyone they feel like whenever they feel like. That right is only ever exercised under certain restricted parameters. Uh, those horrendous regimes that have state-sanctioned torture give the torturer the right to carry out their um, you know, horrible activities which may often perhaps result in the death of the person being tortured. But the, the torturer will not be put on trial for murder if they kill off the individual that they are you know, wiring up to electrodes or whatever violent thing that they're doing to them. Mbembe has this idea that, again, this is a form of necro-power. The power to kill, the power to end a life, to decide whose life is to be ended. And even, going back to that idea of the hangman, it's not simply the, the, the guy or woman pulling the rope, it's the judge signing the death warrant. So even though the, the, the judge never actually pulls the rope, they have agreed so-and-so in the dock is to die. And it is that kind of process. There's a number of people involved in the the right to kill in, well, I'm tempted to say all societies. There, there may be some society somewhere in the world that does not give anyone the right to kill, but it is a very commonplace um, thing. And it changes over time and it reflects part of Mbembe's argument. It's not just saying, oh, it's there, how interesting. But to analyse in a given culture, in a given society, who is granted this power? Under what circumstances are they granted this power? And who are they granted the power against? So is it against a certain type of criminal? You know, people who have committed treason, people who have committed murder, people who have committed rape. Um, is it against um, not, not so much people by their actions, but maybe a wider group of people? So in certain horrendous periods of history, going in and slaughtering uh, you know, pogroms against the Jews, going in and massacring villages of, of Jewish people, or going in and massacring gypsy encampments and that sort of thing. The individuals carrying out those massacres were state-empowered to go and do it. There are also cases where it gets very, what should we say, ambiguous, very grey. So if you're thinking um, Ku Klux Klan lynchings in America in the 1950s and 60s uh, and earlier, um, the American government per se never sanctioned that, but some of the individuals involved in, in carrying out the lynchings and, uh, and so forth were uh, not only members of the Ku Klux Klan, but sometimes turned out to be local government officials who, under the, the disguise of their, their hood, were kind of sanctions. Is it state sanctioned? Is it not when it comes to local government officials, even if the, the national government isn't sanctioning it. There is this sort of blurring area where it's sometimes it's difficult to work out exactly who is sanctioning what, who's turning a you know a blind eye, and the sh sheriff looks in the opposite direction and, and doesn't investigate certain deaths. Does that almost make it state-sanctioned in a sense? Uh, and it becomes a confusing arena on that one. And, and so you could look at um, a particular culture and think about both who has the power to kill and what what groups, what targets are they entitled to kill and what does that say about the society, which lives they value and from Mbembe's point of view, which lives don't they value, which lives don't come in for protection, which lives are, are deemed um, right-offable, if we can just make that word up off the top of my head there. Uh, there's a, a sort of um, concept that goes around this, which uh, an American writer, Judith Butler, touches on. 
Um, a lot of her writing is, is dense to the point of being virtually unreadable, but this, this is maybe one of the more accessible ideas. And it overlaps with a lot of what Mbembe is talking about, so it's worth mentioning. She talks about this idea that certain lives are grievable, uh, have grievability. Philosophers love coming up with these, these rather clunky terms, but a life which is grievable is a life which we are allowed to grieve in public. We are allowed to express sorrow for when that life ends. So someone you, you love, someone who's very dear to you, you are allowed to grieve them. And this, this kind of exists at a number of different levels. There's the grief in the, in the, the overt emotional sense, you know, crying, sobbing, um, wearing black or whatever colour it is in that particular culture people are meant to wear when they go to funerals and express grief. The, the purely human element, but also there is a, a what we might call an, an administrative element. So if you go to your boss and say, can I have a day off work to attend my my father's funeral, my wife's funeral, my, my sister's funeral, you'll probably be given it. And in some countries, actually, it will be legally sanctioned. There's a law saying your boss has got to give you time off work for those sorts of events. If you go along and say, well, my great uncle or my, my second cousin three times removed has died, not many countries have laws which in, in insist that the boss has to give you a time off for that funeral. Or, or you might need more than, you know, not just the funeral, you might need uh, some days off work just to sit at home and grieve and mourn. If you can imagine the sort of horrendous situation where someone's child dies, it's not just go to the funeral and then back to work five minutes later. People need time away, they need time for themselves. So there, there are kind of what we might call administrative state run, run regulations of the grieving process, whereby in some cases, in some countries, the, the your boss is compelled to give you time off whether they want to or not. And in other countries, or sometimes in the same country, depending on who it is that's died, it's down to the, what you might call the whim of your employer, whether they feel like giving you time off or not. You could extend this argument beyond the human. You know. If your dog dies, do you need time off work? Not to go to the funeral or such, because you bury the dog at your own convenience. But just to sit and mourn and feel, if you phone up and say, I can't come in today, my dog has died. Do you have the kind of, of manager who says, don't be so damn stupid and ridiculous, it's just, just a dog. Now get into work, or do you have the kind of, of employer who says, "Oh, how awful, how terrible! Take the day off." Do they say take two days off, one day off? How much grief is is accepted? So there is that kind of element to it. Then you can branch out, and this is something that uh, Butler touches on, to very, very, very public displays of grief. So. Um, I'm of an age to remember when Princess Diana died, and there was an awful lot of people who, had, most of them never ever met Princess Diana, who were crying, weeping, going on to the the, um, the procession of the funeral, bringing flowers and laying flowers, and, and engaging in the whole process of public grief. Um, I can also remember when Margaret Thatcher died, and there were some people who were out in the streets mourning and grieving that, and there were other people who were well, not dancing on her coffin, but they probably would have done given half the chance, who certainly did not grieve and were quite scornful of those who did grieve her passing, saying that she was the terrible woman and she had done this, done that, done the other with her policies and caused problems. Who is grievable, who is not? Um, so you might get uh, upset when, let's say, your um, favourite author, your th favourite singer, your favourite sports star dies. But what about um, those characters whose names are heavily besmirched? So, um, Jimmy Savile. Um, granted, at the time of his death, there weren't that many people who knew he was a serial sex offender. But in the aftermath, it very rapidly got revealed through all the newspaper scandals. And then you can't turn around, well, you could, but it wouldn't go down very well. And this is kind of Butler's point of view. It's not that you get arrested for doing it. It's more that you'll get social disapproval and, and approbation if you went, went around saying how very sad that that serial sex offender has died. People would look at you as if you're a bit bizarre, as if you were somehow condoning their lifestyle and that kind of thing. But of course, some of those individuals, they will have had friends, they will have had family members 
who maybe were never themselves victimized by their abusive um, habits, whatever you want to call it. There will be individuals who want to grieve for them, but they, they are pressured to grieve for them in private behind closed doors because the idea that certain people, if you grieve for them in public, it would seem ghoulish, ghastly, inappropriate, tacky, either because they're a dreadful, awful person or um, sometimes, and, and this is a, one that came up relatively recently when a homeless person um, died in the streets of Westminster and um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, said, you know, what, what, what a sad, awful thing that in one of the, the richest parts of, of one of the richest countries in the world, here is this, this poor guy um, starving to death on the streets, freezing to death on the streets wasn't it awful and some of the newspapers mocked him and said how ridiculous how awful you know and turn off the world works all this kind of thing an individual who is in absolute skid row who's got perhaps no family left or, or is totally alienated from their family whose real identity may be very difficult to establish to find out where the relatives are who ends up with a pauper's funeral uh, may find themselves unmourned and there will perhaps be other homeless people who will miss them, but maybe they don't feel able to go to the funeral. Perhaps you know, if, if, if you're living, let's face it, in a cardboard box, you're not going to be very fragrant. You're going to have all, all sorts of hygiene issues and things like that. Would you be welcome to turn up at a church or, or wherever it is that the funeral is being held? Um, there have been um, cases, uh, there have been a few sort of scandals in the, in the papers and so on, that certain local councils say that when it comes to paupers funerals which have to be paid for at the taxpayers expense there are no mourners permitted at those funerals perhaps with a kind of the implicit assumption that if you want to mourn that individual you should be financing their funeral and if you're not able to finance the funeral don't mourn for them or at least not at the actual funerals you can mourn in private you can go to the mass grave afterwards or what have you and, and um, <sighs> You cry by the grave or lay your flowers or whatever you're going to do but some governments heavily regulate uh, local councils as well as, as national governments heavily regulate who can mourn what and where and how cemeteries have the, all sorts of rules and regulations about how you can express your grief and you know, what you can leave on the grave in terms of flowers and teddy bears and one thing and another and what you're not allowed to leave on the grave so there's all of that kind of um, element that, that's very peripheral to the issue of grievability, but that key idea that some people perfectly fine, you can grieve for them. Other people, well, you can only grieve to a certain extent, you know, so you, you can't have a day off work for that individual, but you can grieve in private at home. Um, other people, you can have the day off work, and, and, and all of those sorts of issues. Who can who can you grieve, and how much can you grieve for them, and. Uh, all of those issues come into play and part of that does come back to Mbembe's idea that is the management of death whose life is worth grieving so the, the the terrorist who goes and blows up a um, cinema full of people all of the poor cinema goers who have died they are very grievable if you express the slightest sympathy for the dead terrorist or their their family members then you would be seen as, as probably quite quite a horrible person so there will be family members and friends who will want to grieve for that person but they're going to have to be very very circumspect about how they do it and that's, that's this kind of notion of not only the management of death but the management of human worth um, we're nearly drawing to an end on this i'm sure your ears must be burning uh, another idea that Mbembe comes up with which does kind of relate to that issue of human worth and sorts of sort of skirts around this issue of of death and so forth is the idea of human merchandise um, it's an idea that relates directly to slavery but actually it incorporates an awful lot more than only slavery so going all the way back to ancient rome ancient greece ancient sumeria and so on people were enslaved slavery has been a, a very very widespread practice the whole world over all sorts of different races different um, you know, men women children old people you name it just about everyone has faced enslavement at some point in the last few thousand years 
A slave is human merchandise. It's a person who can be bought and sold as an object, a bit like buying a sack of potatoes or a, um, a chair or a table. They are a thing to be traded. When you become a thing, you cease to be a person. And your worth is assessed not in terms of are you a lovely person, a kind person, a brave person, a clever person. Your worth is assessed financially. You've got a price tag on you. That is your worth. And that market worth will go up or down according to market demands of you know, supply and demand and all these sorts of issues. You become a marketable product. Um, don't want to go too much into the slavery issue because we'd be here from a very long time. One, one interesting aspect that the may touches on is the idea that we are widely encouraged in the modern world to market ourselves. So you go for a job interview or you're filling in an application for a job form. Um, you, you're, you're kind of thinking of yourself as a product that has to be sold to the prospective employer. How do I get them to buy me, in a sense? And if they do buy you, then they start to have ownership over you. Nowhere near to the same extent as a slave, obviously. But even coming back to that thing about a day off for a funeral and so forth, they own your time. And they can say whether or not you're allowed to do certain things with your time. Or if you, you're unwell and you take a lot of time off work due to an illness, does, does it get to the point where they say, well, you're no longer worth buying, you're no longer worth having, there's the door go. Um, you, you have that worth as a, as a product. Um, so in how we, having taught teenagers in the past, uh, one of the things I had to teach, uh, going back quite a few years now, is employability. And, and you have to sort of get kids to think about well, how would you dress for, a, for an interview, for this kind of job, that kind of job. Um, how would you present yourself, how would you answer the questions and so forth, which is all useful stuff. But an aspect of it is that kind of marketing. So just as a, a, an advertising agency would dress up a product to make it look nicer, in the, the newspaper adverts or the TV adverts to, to sell it, it, to people. So you're encouraged as a, an individual to start treating yourself, you know, I've got to make myself glamorous by wearing this or by wearing that, I've got to present myself this way, that way. You become an it, you become a product which is marketed, bought and sold. And Part of Mbembe's argument is that starts to decrease your worth as a human being. You become a thing uh, rather than a person. You become an object, a, a marketable commodity. And certainly governments, especially again if we're moving away from very small tribal societies to much big, bigger scale societies, when there's so many people, thousands if not millions of people, that you, most of them you will never ever meet. If you're the king, the prime minister, the president, whatever you may be, you will never meet the vast majority of people in your society. They cease to be people, they become numbers, statistics, figures to be moved around on graphs and tables. They become, if you like, after a while, commodities, bought, sold, traded, engaged with. And that starts to devalue the individual. Um, which then, just just as if, I suppose you've got a, a car and at some point it's no longer worth having, you might sell it off, you might take it to the scrapyard and get it destroyed. So there are people whose market worth plummets so low due to old age, due to illness, due to disability, this, that, the other, that they may not be seen as worth preserving in a society and so we come back to this issue of necro power and their death starts to be managed potentially um, are they worth the investment of keeping them alive what's the return on the investment in the language of the marketplace starts to come into play the more you use the language of the marketplace the less you're talking about a human being a person the more you're talking about a product, a thing, a marketable commodity. So all of this kind of starts to overlap and, and there's a great deal more to his theories than I've just said here. I'm just giving a kind of a skim view that might be useful or interesting to some people. Um, he does talk about things like techno-animism and the way we start treating objects as people and
people as objects. So that it's kind of two sides to the same coin, where we almost put more personality and value into, let's say, a laptop or a, an iPod or an iPad than we do into a human being. Those, those two kind of issues feed into one another or feed off one another, whichever direction that goes in. Um, but I, th I think I've waffled on more than enough, so we'll, we'll draw that to a close here. And then if anyone's got angles they want to take, no questions to ask, maybe that could lead to some future uh, podcast, or, or if it's one of the students, it's something we can pick up on in class perhaps.